Good evening. We finished Bezrat Hashem, Sefer Bereshit. We are now starting Sefer Shmot. Uh, finished Genesis, starting Exodus. Just one announcement before I start the lecture. Next Monday I won't be in New York. No lecture next Monday. I'll be back in the following Monday, Bezrat Hashem. Wait one second. What, what would be the following Monday? Uh, huh? No, this coming is the 16. Oh, probably also the following Monday I won't be here. All right, so please follow the events in my website to know if there is lectures or not. I update it every day or two. I update it. Because right now I'm going to LA next Monday, and the following Monday is 95% chance that I'm going to have to be in Israel. So probably the next two Mondays will be off. Uh, for next Monday, it's for sure off. The following Monday, check in events to see. I update it. Just like when I did in Canada. I didn't know if I'll be able to come back or no. I update it, and we knew that there is a lecture. In general, it's always good to look in the event, because sometimes there's lectures in places you don't know, like in different nights of the week. Could be in your area. Uh, Next, this coming Shabbat, we're going to start Parashat Shmot, the book of Shmot, Sefer Shmot. And starting with uh, Jacob's going to Egypt with 70 people. And uh, after 210 years of, of slavery over there, they're coming out few millions. How is it possible that a nation that uh, in, a, in a period of 200 years plus become from 70 people, become such a massive nation? The answer is in the text of the Torah that uh, God made a rule that the more the Egyptian will torture the nation, the Hebrews, the, the Jewish nation, the more they will multiply. The more they try to limit them, to make them not have kids, to kill their babies, and all the decrees that they made, Eventually, the, they reach the opposite. They multiply, they give birth to six babies in one delivery. Just now, about uh, two months ago, I posted in my Facebook page a, a film of a woman that gave birth to nine babies. Not six, nine. Everyone was arguing with me over the years, you really believe you can give birth to six kids, six babies in one shot? Uh, there are many cases, if you do a research, there are many cases of five, six, seven, and now even nine, which I think it's a world record, Some, somewhere in Russia, speaking in Russian, the woman. So, yes, it's possible. Is it a miracle? The answer is yes. What's the difference between one or two babies, which is coming, to, na to six? What's the difference? The frequency. It's the same miracles. What do you think, from a drop of seed and an egg, all of a sudden a human being comes out, so it's a problem that from a drop it will share into two eggs and it's going to be two babies, so now it shares to six eggs. What's the difference? Well, here, so you take a drop and you have uh, six little cups. So now you put in one, baby will come out. You want to do, you put in another one, two babies. You put in all six, six babies are coming out. So what's, the, what's bigger of a miracle here? The transaction is, is the same transaction. It's nothing bigger. It's just that we are not used to it because it's not a common thing today. Well, the person gives birth, birth to six. So people are amazed. How can it be? What do you mean? In the time of the slavery and then in the time of the 10 plagues and then the exodus of Egypt and then 40 years in a desert, every minute, every second was a miracle. You see the entire Torah describing one miracle after the other. Now, you have a doubt if all these miracles happen or not. The doubt comes out of ignorance. Why it comes out of ignorance? Very simple. Because remember, when Moshe comes and gives the Torah 49 days after the exodus of Egypt, and he gives them the Torah that he received from Hashem, and they open up the Torah and they begin to read all these strange miracles, Things that nobody, are, nobody is used to, blood over, all over Egypt, frogs, every firstborn is dying, six in one delivery, all these things that we're talking about, right? Bread is falling from heaven, 
the ocean split, the Dead Sea split, the Jews went through, the Egyptian drowned, all kinds of very, very extraordinary miracles. If one of them was not precise the way it described in the Torah, in reality, one little detail was changed, no one would agree to accept the Torah for Moshe. That's what people don't understand. It's very simple common sense. You don't have to be an investigator or a genius to understand this. Because when the people receive the Torah, they open it up and they read. They say, you used to give birth six to one delivery, six babies. We so say, what is this nonsense? Who made up this, this movie? It's, it's a movie, it's, not, it's, it's fiction. We never gave birth. Oh, the ocean split? We didn't know. Oh, we were in Egypt? I didn't know we were in Egypt. Oh, we have bread falling next to our tent every day? Very strange. It really doesn't happen. One detail. You don't need the entire hundred miracles that describe over there that they all will be false. One out of a hundred will be false. It's an indication the book is not divine. God didn't give it. Finished. End of story. How about all the other ones happen? Incredible miracles, I admit. Now you want me to dedicate my life to this book? Very interesting. But I have one problem. I know for sure this book, God never gave it to you, Moshe. With all due respect. How do you know? You trust me, I'm a li you suspect me, I'm a liar? Yes. You know why? Very simple. It says here that I was born together with five brothers in one shot. And he was born with five brothers. Where are these twins? Where are they in the nation? I don't see where they are. Or it says that we had water and they had blood. Where is it? I don't remember that we ever had a situation like this, that the neighbors, the Egyptians, had blood and we had water. You say all these things happened in Egypt? This one did not happen. The animals never died. The frogs never came. The grasshoppers never came and ate all the leaves. All these things that this book is saying, it's beautiful, but it never happened. So remember, all they had to do is to say that one of the details in a book is incorrect, and Judaism will be over before it even started. So far it's clear. Now let's move on. The Torah describes that in the end of the book of Genesis, up to then, when Yaakov and Yosef were alive, this is the leaders of the Jewish nation. Yosef is the king. He's in politics. He sits in Congress. He's uh, almost the president of the United States. And then you have the chief rabbi, which is Yaakov. So together you have the, the treasury of the United States. And the chief rabbi that everyone bowed down to is an important man, even according to the goyim. So there's great leaders. So the situation of the Jewish nation couldn't be better. But what is really the reason why the situation was good? You know why? Besides, Yosef is in power. Yosef is in charge of all the money. We know the whole story. There's one main reason over here, and that's remained until this moment. It's relevant even to today. What is it? When the Jews lived in a ghetto, everything was fine. Throughout history, whenever the Jews closed themselves in a certain area with a wall, in a certain isolated area, no Gentiles are coming in and out, even the good Gentiles, not the bad Gentiles, not the good Gentiles, no one comes in and out. It's all in Hebrew, it's all in Yiddish, it's all in, uh, in Aramaic, whatever the, the, the Hebrews, whatever they spoke in that place, these were the signs. Everything was with the Shivot, with the rabbi, they had their own Beidin, there's a problem, there's a delegation, they go to the rabbi, they don't get mixed with the secular courts of that place, they don't mix with their anything to do with the country. We are here, but we're really not here. We live our own life in our own planet. That's what it is, Eretz Goshen. Yosef said to them, go and get this piece of land over there. Nobody will bother you. Nobody will see you. Tell them that you are shepherds. They would be disgusted from you because this is their God. So they don't want you next to them. So they put you far away, which this is what we want. We don't want to mix with them. This has worked for a long, long time. When the problem started, if you read in the parasha, if you pay attention to the word, it's so clear, you cannot miss it. When did the problem start? The problem start 
when the Torah said in this parasha, Vatimale Aaretz Otam, and the land of Egypt started to get full of the Jews. All over, they moved to Cairo, to Alexandria, to all these other places. Today they have different names. Doesn't matter, in that time they had different names. But it's the same lady with a different dress. Doesn't matter, it's the same thing. All over Egypt, all of a sudden, the Jews are in. Doctors, lawyers, business people, buying houses in the best neighborhoods, driving nice cars. So in their time, having an expensive horse, expensive donkey, expensive camel, what difference does it make? The concept is the same concept. Wearing nice clothes, they have the best jobs in the businesses, everyone comes, they see they own so much, they're starting to go crazy. So what comes next? What comes next? The racism starting to rise, anti-Semitism, and they say, listen, they have an emergency meeting. What's the new king, supposedly, which is the same king? Yosef. Chazal say he got leprosy. Someone who has leprosy is considered dead. Someone who's lost all his money is considered like dead, not dead, like dead. Uh, someone who doesn't have children is considered like dead. Not that he's dead, he's alive and he's gaining a lot of mitzvot. But it's similar to be dead. Why? Because of certain reasons. Person doesn't have money, cannot buy tefillin, cannot buy a tro, cannot buy lulav, cannot afford kosher food, cannot even buy a yamaka to his children. So, I mean, this is very bad life. You know, we're not talking luxury here. So this is really similar to being dead, that the dead cannot do any mitzvot. Uh, someone who supposedly doesn't have continuation. So that means he's already, he's like Chaz Shalom, is considered similar to that. All these things that the Chazal say, it's only comparison. It's not really literally considered because a person that is alive, he has a big mission in life. So um, we have big Chachamim, Ben Azai, uh, Yonatan Ben Uziel. They, they didn't want to get married, b'chlal. They didn't know about this. They knew that if you don't have kids, you don't have continuation. They knew that a person is incomplete, is incomplete until he is incomplete until he has his own wife and children. One, one is not married, is not complete yet. They knew all that. They loved the Torah so much, so it didn't, it didn't bother them. They said, love to the Torah comes before everything else. So you see, there's other alternative possibilities, but anyway, once the Jews started to go from the ghetto all over Egypt, they had, a, they had a meeting. And the king said to all his advisors, listen, tomorrow it's gonna be a war with our enemy. Remember, Egypt is the empire of the world at that time, the strongest country. If that's gonna be a war, and the enemies will come and attack Egypt, what do you think these Jews will do, these Hebrews? They are strangers, they're not one of us. We gave them a land here when, the, when Jacob came. You know, respected him. He was the father of the treasury, Yosef. We owed a lot to Yosef. These days are over. He doesn't care about Yosef anymore. Yosef passed away. The, the ideal days of the Jews are over. So what now? We have to do something before they gain power, even more than what they already have. So let's start making rules exactly like the Nazis did. Not right away in one week they send them to the gas chambers. No. In the beginning, you cannot sit here, you cannot get a card, you cannot get membership, you cannot enter the club, you cannot enter this, you cannot go in politics, you cannot build your shul, all kinds of things. And later, they kill the people. Same thing over here. What do you think? Right away he killed the babies? Right away he told the male dot. The, the nurses that they should kill the babies? No. In the beginning, he came to work himself. That's what Chazal teaching us. In the beginning, he himself came to put some bricks when they started to build. It's a great mission. He hired Egyptians also. It wasn't racism in the beginning. Jews and non-Jews came to work for salary. Later, slowly, slowly, he got rid of the Egyptians, and then the Jews were still getting paid a little bit, and then he said to them, problems, you have to finish the job and I cannot afford to pay you. And all of a sudden it became a pattern, you know, every week become worse than before and that's it, you lost control. It's already your job, 
You were working there, you're getting paid. Now you start getting paid. Next thing, they kill your babies. What can you do now? You lost all your power. So this is it, what happened here. So, I have a question to ask. This is the question. Chazal say that the new king, Chaparo, that the Torah said, Vayako Melech Hadash al Mitzrayim, this king who came and controlled Mitzrayim is really the same one. It used to be Pharaoh, and it's the same Pharaoh. And even if it was another one, perhaps his son, what difference does it make? You know that everyone in Egypt owed their life to this Yosef, to the Jews. Without them, you didn't have what to eat. You will all be starved to death. So t- your whole existence is thanks to him. Whether it was a new king or not, doesn't really matter. He lived in that generation. He got food. Thanks to their father. So how can he's now going to go and, and fight against them? This is called ungratefulness. Kfui tova. So Chazal says like this. The reason that it happened is because he had bad traits. Paro was kfui tova. Ungrateful. It sounds like a joke. Why it sounds like a joke? Imagine somebody come and say, you know, Hitler did not have good personality. Hitler did not have good midot. What would they say about this person? <laughs> this person is drunk. <laughs> he murdered, he butchered, he made so many people lose their money, their life, their children. He made so many people suffer in the world. Not only the Jews. The Jews is a part of the entire picture. Hundreds of millions suffer because of this murderer. He's the biggest monster perhaps in history. And he comes and says, you know, it was kfui tova. He didn't have good personality. So if a person say it on the street, you can suspect that he's drunk. Maybe he smoked something, I don't know. But if Chazal, our sages are telling us in the name of Hashem, everything comes out of their mouth, is with Hashem's approval. They never say something just because they feel that maybe that's what happened. No. This is, the, the, the Torah is very valid. If Chazal say Paro was kfui tova, it means that Chazal knew that being ungrateful is actually worse than being a murderer and all the other things that he was doing. Killing 150 babies every morning and every evening, 300 babies a day, taking the blood out of their body, feeling himself a bat, what we call today jacuzzi, taking a shower with their bloods because he had leprosy and they believe that this blood will cure his leprosy because there's no cure for it. Murdering 300 kids and all the other problems, taking Jews out of their home, making them slaves, destroying them mentally, no problem. Being ungrateful to Yosef and to the Jews, big problem. If somebody asks you tomorrow, what is the main thing in Judaism? What? What is this? What's the whole idea of being a Jew? So the answer is, as I said many times before, it's one word, mode and mode. Modé, the word modé. What does it mean, modé? Modé means two, one word, two meanings. Modé means thank you, I thank you, Hashem. And I also admit. Ani modé, I admit. I admit that this is the truth. Modé, I admit. And also, thank you. This is really what Judaism is all about. Always, everything in life is about thanking God and, and admitting that that's the truth. If you have these two skills, you are a very kosher Jew. If you are an ungrateful person, this is the thing that God hates the most. What does he hate? He hates ungratefulness. Where do we see that he hates ungratefulness? There's hundreds of examples. For, for instance, Ammon and Moab. This is two nations who came from Lot. Lot, his daughters made him drunk, and they had relation with him, and they conceived. And two babies were born, Ammon and Moab. And Ammon and Moab became later nations. Who is their uncle? Abraham. Abraham is their uncle. Many generations later, when the Jews walked through their land, they did not come and give the Jews bread and water. They didn't give them bread and water. Since they did not give them bread and water, God said they can never convert. The male, women is not modest to give bread to the male, to strangers. So they are not guilty. 
but the male of Ammon and the males of Moab, they can never ever convert to the chosen nation. Never. Why? Because they are ungrateful. Ungrateful people God does not want in his nation. Why? They were much worse people than them. The Egyptians were murderers. They murdered the Jews. They tortured them. Hashem say only Paro, his son, three generations cannot convert. The rest can convert, no problem. It's not their fault. The grandson of Hitler wants to convert, fine. It's not, it's not his problem that his grandfather was a monster. Yeah, the blood, he came from him. People doesn't go by blood, they go by free choice. Your free choice make you either righteous or wicked, depend what you choose. Your father can be a monster, you can be a big tzaddik. Your father can be a big rasha, you can be a big tzaddik. We saw hundreds of examples like this throughout history. You do not inherit righteousness or wisdom from your parents. You don't. Many parents are great and their children are bums. Or the other way around. A complete ignorant father and the son is a very big Talmud Chacham. We saw many cases like this. Maybe they did a big mitzvah and Hashem rewarded them with such a soul. That of a big tzaddik. We saw many cases like this, so therefore we cannot uh, make rules when it applies to this because it's really not gonna, going to be correct. So now, coming and saying Hitler didn't have good midot sounds very silly if you are saying it or every person saying it. But when Chazal saying to you, Paro did not have midot, bad, good midot, then you know that's the root of the problem, that he was an ungrateful human being. One time a student asked the rabbi, so rabbi, the Gemara teaching us that there are three questions that are asked when a person dies. As soon as a Jew died, he has, his trial begins with three common routine questions. First question, did you set up time every day to learn Torah? That's the first thing they check you. You learn Torah every day, yes or no? Second question, did you do, you conduct your business and your life in honesty and integrity or no? Or you are a crook, deceiving, lying, forging, etc. And the third question, did you expect the salvation, the Yeshua, the arrival of the Mashiach every hour of your life? That's the third question. That's three questions. So if the trial begins with these three questions, it goes from the most important, of course. First question is the most important. It means this is boiling. First thing Hashem wants to ask you, did you learn Torah every day? We don't need this Gemara. We know from other places in the Gemara that Limud Torah can negate Kulam. The learning of Torah on a scale is equal like all the other mitzvot combined. So we know for sure it's the most important thing. Limud Torah can negate Kulam. Bitul Torah can negate Kulam. The greatest reward for learning Torah, the biggest punishment for not learning Torah. That's how it works. The value of Torah is very high. Gaining it, you gain a lot. Losing it, you lose a lot. Very simple. But the question is, this Talmud, the student asked his rabbi, we have the prime minister Ben-Gurion, which was a very wicked person. Why was a wicked person? He was a communist, anti-religion, does not keep mitzvot, eat whatever moves, everything who moves he eats, doesn't care about kosher, not Shomer Shabbat, and many other problems with him. So in that case now, what's the point of asking him after he did so many bad things, for instance, there was a boat called Altalena. The boat of, uh, of uh, they arrived Jews like sardines in a boat, and he gave an order, we don't want to have an argument with the British, the British were in charge in Israel, shoot at them. Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin, the prime minister of Israel, was the commander in charge on the beach. He was waiting for the boat to arrive. He was a young general. So he asked the old man, this is what he wrote in his book, Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin, in his book. He wrote, the old man gave an order, and I had to comply with the orders. Sounds so similar to somebody else. But is, they ask him, don't you regret that you and your soldiers shot and killed 16 people in a boat, 16 of your brothers and sisters? You killed 16 innocent Jews? So his answer was, why should I regret? I was the commander in charge, and the old man, which means the prime minister at that time, gave the order, and I had no other choice but to comply with his orders. This is what a good soldier does. If you don't believe me, read it in his own book. It's Rabin bragging when he was a senator in the United States before he became prime minister for the first time. 
He was prime minister twice. Before he became a prime minister, he was a senator here in America. And American senators ask him, how a Jew, a general, shoot on his own people? And instead of saying, yeah, it was a very big mistake, a dark moment in my life, I wish I can turn the wheel back. I, I comply with the order, but believe me, it kills me. I wish I can go something to save your reputation, like a monster. I don't regret. I kill innocent Jews that came poor, like sardines in a boat after months in the ocean suffering after the Holocaust. I shot them and killed them. Why? Because I didn't want to bother the British that they control Israel and they're very pro-Arab. So why am I telling you this story? So this student asked the rabbi, tell me please, rabbi, when someone like Ben-Gurion who gave the order to shoot the Jews, and he cuts the peot of the Yemenite people as soon as they arrive to Israel, and he did so many horrible things, what's the point of asking him in his trial, did you learn Torah every day? It sounds like a joke. First question, why you murdered your own people? That's first question. You're guilty of killing 16 innocent people. That's where the trial should be, no? What are you asking him, did you learn Torah or not? What is he? He doesn't even believe in the Torah. He doesn't believe in Hashem Bechlal. Which is not true, by the way. Because I found a book, which is very interesting. As wicked as he was, he had few good skills about him that we can learn from him. He one time met Albert Einstein here in New York. They were sitting together for an hour. The entire hour, guess what they spoke about? If God exists or not. All the questions he asked Albert Einstein was about God. And Albert Einstein told him, for sure, the more we, we see the beauty of, na of science, of nature, we see that there's a supervisor who runs the show. Einstein shared with him, and they came and agreed that for sure God exists. Between believing in God and being religious Jew, there's a big distance. Many people believe in God. The question is, who is this God? Yeah, there's a boss to the world, but who is he? Ah, until you get from here to know that he's the one who gave the Torah and Judaism is the only truth, sometimes it can take 70 years to get to reach the right conclusion. But what, so that one, that's one thing. So it, he did believe in God, not like some people think that he was a complete atheist. And one other good thing came out of him, that he is the one who made the rule that people who learn Torah do not go to the army. It's very interesting, because twice in history this rule was achieved in, in, in a secular authority. Once it was by Ben-Gurion, who was very anti-religion. How a very anti-religious, uh, anti-religion prime minister make a rule that people who sit in yeshiva and learn Torah are dismissed from servicing in the army. How something like this happened? It's a very big miracle. If you anti anti-Torah, you're the last person who should agree to something like this. Who else agreed to something like this? Our friend here, Paro. Paro made a rule in his time that all the people who learn their religion, not necessarily only the Torah, Shevet Levi was learning Torah, they are dismissed from slavery, not from the army. Much worse. Army, you help your country. Slavery, you slave, you, just, you have no life. What is this? So Paro made a rule that all the people who sit and learn their religion dismiss from the army, taxes, army, everything. Not only that, they get money from Paro, from the government. That's how amazing it was. That's, by the way, why Shevet Levi, the tribe of Levi, Levi, was the smallest tribe. Smallest, why? Because only the one who suffer multiply. The one who suffer, Kasher ye anu oto ken irbe ve ken ifrots. The more they torture them, the more they expand. Ah, they were not tortured, they sit and learn Torah and enjoy, they won't expand like the rest. Smallest tribe. It's very interesting. So, he said to the rabbi, Rabbi, what's the point of asking Ben-Gurion if he learns Torah? So the answer is, of course, of course, that's what, what Hashem is going to ask him. That's why he asks every person. No, ex no exception to the rule here. 
Why, if you would learn Torah daily, there is no chance you would be such a monster. The only reason you shot the Jews because you don't have Torah. You had Torah, your, your finger would, would freeze. Wouldn't be able to kill innocent immigrants who just arrived after months of suffering. Looks like sardines in a boat, freezing, hungry. Your hands wouldn't go. Whatever the British think, let them think. You will never agree such a thing. There's nothing to do with religion or not. If you're a human being or not, that's first, the first question. Ah, you know why you like this? If you learn Torah and ethic and Musar every day, it would change you to become a better person. And if not, that means you're not learning. Maybe you are in yeshiva, but you're drinking and smoking and talking on the phone and taking long lunch break, lunch nap. Some people sit in yeshiva to warm the chair. They have nothing else to go. They're afraid of their fathers. So they pretend they're in yeshiva. Otherwise, they, get, they lose the credit card, they lose the car, they lose the status of the family. So they don't want to argue with their parents. So they sit in yeshiva. They play Game Boys under the table. You understand? That's very small minority. Most of the people in yeshiva are very serious. Because if you, if you fake, you won't survive there more than a month or two. Right away. Everyone will detect you. Now remember, it's not a public school, but they must keep you there. The Shiva, if you're not good, they, the Rosh Shiva say you don't belong here. Go to another place. Especially when there's always budget problems. So if you have 60% enough for 60% of the people, the rest cannot get paid. Who are you going to keep? The good ones or the bad ones? Only the good ones. So the bad ones always move from one place to another. They cannot find a place. So let's move on. The story begins a while back when Yosef, it's the loved son of Yaakov Avinu, he comes to his father and tells him certain things about the brothers. And one time Yosef comes to the brother who he knows that they hate him already. Think about it. He knows he hates, they hate him. And he said to them, I had a dream that all of you are bowing down to me. That I'm the king and all of you, imagine now you go to 10 Arabs that hate you, want to kill you every second when they see you, and say to Mustafa, Ahmed, Said, Muhammad, come, come, I have something to tell you. I had a great dream last night. In my dream, I was with a crown and sitting on a beautiful chair on a stage. And all of you together came and stood in a line and bowed out to me and kissed my hand. <laughs> Whether they want to kill you already. What are you adding fire, uh, oil to the fire? You, do not, you don't want to make them even more angrier. This is basically what's happening here. They're already jealous with him. His father made him a special outfit. They go crazy when they see him. And he's from a different mother. There's a lot of problems over there. He comes and he says, oh, you know, I had a dream that all of you are coming and bowing down to me. So they say to him, Amalochtim loch alenu, you have the nerve to tell us in our face that we, you're going to be our king? You'll be our king? We'll teach you what does it mean. Let's sell him right away. They put him in a hole, and the rest we know. What happened? The Goim come, the Arabs, they picked him, they bought him for 20, for a price of shoes, 20 coins. Then they took him to Egypt. Thanks to who he became the king of Egypt? Thanks to them. What do you see here? It's very interesting. When a person tries to resist a divine decree, not only he cannot be successful, Hashem will use him to exercise his decree. Let me give you two examples. The Gemara brings a story, Yosef Mokir Shabbos. Every Jewish boy knows this story. They even make a lot of videos about it nowadays. Yosef Mokir Shabbos, Yosef is a Jew. He goes to the market and he buys the best stuff in the market for Shabbat. Fish, the best fish. Fruits, the best fruit. Meat, the best meat. All the people, on the, on the owners of the boots in the market, they know if they have something special, they put it aside for Yosef. He's the only one who paid top dollars for it. One time two go in, they call a big fish, and they wanted to sell it in the market. But the story started before that, that Yosef has a neighbor as a goy, very, very rich goy. Very rich. He has real estate, possessions, all kinds of things. 
And he has a dream that constantly repeats that all his wealth will go to his neighbor that he hates so much, which is Yosef the Jew. And Yosef sings Mirot Shabbat, and the guy go crazy in his house hearing the songs in Hebrew. He goes crazy. And the Semite guy. So he comes to his advisors, the guy. He says, I want you to tell me what's, how am I going to protect myself from this dream that constantly come. Obviously, if I have this dream all the time, that means all my wealth will go to the person I hate the most in the world. So they told him, sell everything you have, everything, and buy a big ruby or a diamond, like 10 carat, big ones, worth millions, and put it inside your hat. Make a hat that always is going to be on the head, and the diamond will be hidden inside. No matter where you're going to go, you're always going to carry your possession with you. So you can never take over. You cannot get your property, you cannot put his hand on your cash, because you're always watching it. Even when you sleep, you sleep, your head is on it, you're always going to have it by you. Nobody would know. It's a great idea. So he started to sell all his things, everything, sold his buildings, sold his hotels, sold his fields, sold his jewelry, everything, and he got that big ruby and put it in his hat. One time he walked on a bridge by the lake, all of a sudden, a hurricane came, you know, this wind. Like about a month ago, I was here on Queens Boulevard. <laughs> After I finished the lecture here, I went to the second lecture. It's only a few blocks away from here. So all of a sudden, wind came. I started, I felt the car is about to fly in the air. Boom, boom, boom like this, rain. How much? Like, I said, Baruch Hashem, I'm not out of the car. I would fly. One or two minutes, that's it. And everything stopped. That's, I guess, what happened to him. <laughs> One minute of strong wind, the hat flew all over to the water. The water, what can he do? Disappeared. Here guns all his possession. A week later, he already bought things for Shabbat. Friday afternoon, two goyim brought a gigantic fish. They bring it to the market. And they said to, who was going to buy this fish? Now remember, there's no refrigerator and freezer like today. You don't sell it today. By, by Sunday, this fish is spoiled, especially in the heat of Israel. So they run like crazy, and they see all the Jews folding their boots. That's it. Shabbos is in an hour or two. So they said to the Jews, no, 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 nobody's going to buy this fish. It's a shame. Look at this fish. So there's only one person in town that may buy this fish, even though it's an hour before Shabbat, even though he bought fish already, because this is really special fish. This is his address. Go knock on his door. They come to Yosef. They say, Yosef, we heard that you respect Shabbat a lot. Here. Say, so, okay, this is what I have left. You want me? Okay, here. Take it. I bought fish, but this is much more respectful for Shabbat. I respect Shabbat. Give me this fish. Now he opened the fish. He opened it up. He see a hat inside. He opened the hat. He see a huge diamond or ruby, whatever it was. Wow. Became very rich. Why I'm telling you this story now? What's the connection? If, if the Goy would not sell all his possession, you know how much troubles HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to have in order for him to fulfill this dream? Yosef would have to take over his fields and his hotel and his buildings and his cash and his jewelry. It's too much of a hassle. It will take months to collect everything together. So the guy wants to resist Hashem decree. So Hashem is using him to do the job for Yosef. Same thing, Haman. Haman wants to hang Mordechai. He runs, he builds a tree. You know, he makes a place for Mordechai. Why? Well, he has to make the tree very, very high, very, very tall tree. <laughs> what happened in the end? Everything a man, here, you have room right here and right here. Whatever you want. Uh, so Haman prepared everything, everything for, actually, for his own execution. One time, two students were in yeshiva, and the rabbi said to them, tomorrow morning we do not learn in yeshiva. We go to the forest and we learn all day. They said, rabbi, how are we going to eat there? We don't have our kitchen over there. The cook, 
the pots. He said, do you trust Hashem that he's the one who feeds us? I said, of course. So why do you worry so much? We'll go to the field, to the forest, and we'll see how we manage. Next day, they went to the forest. 10 o'clock in the morning, no breakfast. Everyone sits and learn. These two are whispering to each other. This rabbi probably is beginning to lose his mind. We're going to starve here all day. You wait and see. Two o'clock in the afternoon, no lunch. Now they're really hungry already. Hungry and angry. So, four o'clock in the afternoon, the guy said to his friend, listen, another hour or two, I'm fainting. What is it, Yom Kippur? Let's go to the yeshiva, eat, and then we come back here. If we count on him, we'll starve here until the night. So they went to the yeshiva, they ate everything. Now they're about to go back. So one said to his friend, hey, ve'avta l'reacha kamocha, no? Should love your friend like you love yourself. Ma, we, we fool now, they're all starving over there. Let's get a big bowl of rice, chickens, whatever. We'll take it with us, with some breads, and we'll bring it to the forest, and then we'll scream that Be'emeh, oh, Hashem sent us the food. So they collect, they cook, they meet, they heat, they put everything, and they come, they carry everything. They bring it to the forest, very heavy, they sweat, they put it behind the rabbi, and quietly they go and they hide. And after five minutes, one of them says, Rabbi, you're such a genius. Look, Hashem sent us the food all the way to here. It's steam comes out, it's even hot. A miracle. So the rabbi, oh, Ishtabach Shemo, you never let me down. He starts to dance, <laughs> singing, let's dance for the miracle Hashem made for us. And everyone laughs. And everyone says, well, our rabbi becoming a senile, senile, poor rabbi. So that's it. The day is over. They went back to the shiva. Friday, the rabbi gives a drasha, a lecture about the upcoming parasha. So in the end of his lecture, he say, there are two people here that think that I'm senile, I'm old, and they think they are smart. And I said that Hashem is going to take care of us and get us the food to whatever we learn. And they didn't trust Hashem, so they had to go all the way to the yeshiva in the heat, getting there, making their own food, eating over there. They just don't know one thing. Not only that I was right and Hashem supplied everything we needed, He used them to be our servant. You understand how it works? This is how it works. This is how life works. What you think you can go against Hashem and fight against Him? Not only you cannot succeed, He's going to use you to do His job. This is what's going on here. So, what are we seeing here? The brothers of Yosef told him, Amaloch timloch alenu. You have the nerve to tell us you're going to be our king? We'll show you what king you're going to be. They throw him to the hall. Next thing they sell him to the Arabs. You won't be a king. What happened? Thanks to them, he became a king where Hashem wanted him to be a king. This is what's going on. You go and you fight against people, competitor, competition, somebody open next to you. you not only you're not hurting him, you're burying yourself even more. The opposite. If you will trust Hashem that He does everything for good, everything that supposedly they do against you will be all used against them and will be for you. And if you check your entire life, you see that the things that your enemy wanted to do to you was the greatest thing ever happened to you. Check carefully and you see. If you trusted Hashem, if you go back to war, then you can lose. Then they can really hurt you. But if you say, I'm putting my head down, you are the boss, you decide what you want to do, everything will work out. Many rabbis that were kicked from certain areas because they were too strict, I, in one city there's a great example. There's one rabbi, very big tzaddik, he was strict with his community because they wanted to be half enough. Half enough in Monsi standard. Over here it will be 99.1. You know, over here. But over there in Monsi, it's considered half enough. So, you know, so they, he's very, very strict. They wanted, instead of praying three and a half hours, they wanted only two and a half hours, which is still very good. 
but for his standard, it's not good. You don't want to go to another modern shul. You don't belong here. But they have the money, and they started to make problems. And one day, they wanted to kick him out. So what happened? Few of the rich people from the community went and built him a seven million dollar shul, looked like Bet Hamikdash. Beautiful shul, and became the strongest shul in Monsi, perhaps in America. Packed, people walk an hour and a half every Shabbat to hear him in his beautiful building. Fantastic place, and the other place, the other place, came Rosh Hashanah. The Baal Tokea, all the entire davening could not blow one time in a shofar. And it's an expert. Oh, ah, trying, changing the shofar, no voice coming out. The entire Rosh Hashanah, they couldn't hear shofar. And all the people who fought against him, one after the other, either died or got divorced and his family fell apart. One after the other. And they prepared for him the greatest shul, the greatest possession, and now nobody makes a B because everyone over there enjoy to pray. They want to be 100% righteous. So whatever you think that your enemy is coming to hurt you, think again. They are doing you the greatest service. Just let Hashem perform. Don't you ever worry. Nobody can touch you if you don't deserve it. If you deserve it without them, you lose it. Think Hashem needs them to make a revolution in a shul against you? If you deserve your position, you'll have it. You don't deserve it, the government can take you away. Sickness can take you away. Your own family, your wife can come and say, I'm tired of this city, I don't want to live here. Let's go back to Israel. Many things can happen. And Hashem doesn't need these traders to go and fight against you. So I started to say, once the Jews left Goshen, the ghetto, and they started to go all over Egypt, they started to get jobs, they started to control the business, the goyim went crazy. Every store they go in in Egypt, an Hebrew. Every courtroom, a, Jew, a Jewish judge. Every law office, an Hebrew lawyer. Every hospital, an Hebrew doctor. So what's going on? They control all the authorities. This, that, Bernanke, Greenspan, this, the senator, what's going on? Tomorrow it's going to be a war. This is spies inside. They'll join the enemy, they'll destroy us. Let's start making rules. Just like the Nazis did. Paro come to the Shifra in Pua. Yochevet and Miriam, Shifra in Pua. Shifra is Nick's name. Shifra Meshaperet et Aubar, improving. Pua, she's going, ah, ah, you know, like to the baby. So that, that's how they got their nickname. So he said to them, Paro, you, you are delivering the babies, what we call midwives today. That's how they used to do it. They need a doctor for it. She, they know their jobs. So their job is midwives. So they, you come, you see now, when the head of the baby comes out, first comes the head. If it's a girl, pull it out. If it's a boy, kill him before he comes out. That's the instructions. Later, they were afraid of, the Torah said they're afraid of Hashem. They don't want to kill the Jewish babies. So Paro, Paro heard that everyone who comes to these midwives is born naturally. So he ran quickly to call them. What is this? I'm the king. I gave you instructions. What are you doing? Guess what the answer they gave him? They say to him, the Jewish women are different than the goyim here. Before we arrive on the call, they already gave birth. The baby is out. What do we, what do we care? What's nafkamina? So Paro should say, who cares? So kill him then. What do I care? I told you to take a sack, plastic, and choke his face, and choke him until he dies, no? So what do I care if, we, if, we, if the head only came out or the entire body came out? Why? Now we're going to see one of the biggest arguments in history. When is a person considered an independent human being and when is not? This, the arguments about abortion. Everywhere in the world this argument exists. In the Arab countries nobody ever say. 
But if they give them freedom, many of the Arab women, when they sin, they want to have the right to make an abortion. Over there now, nobody will dare to do such a thing because they hang you in the middle of Tehran. It's not like here they give you an award for being a great doctor for murdering 5,000 babies this year. Only in Israel, in America, it can be such a corruption that a person will murder babies every hour and get an award for it and will be able to publish book and express his opinions on national television. But in the normal countries that we call the evil countries, but believe me, they're much smarter than are in many ways, they know over there that nobody will give you freedom to be a murderer. There's no doubt whatsoever that an abortion is a murder. No doubt. There's no, maybe there's another opinion. The question is, from what day of the pregnancy is a murder or not? Everybody agree that from the 48 days of the pregnancy, it's complete murder, because it's a complete baby. By the 48 day, he has pulse, brain waves, nerve system, is a complete human being, it's male or female, is the size of a quarter. This is the size of the baby in a 48 day. And the scientists, they make some experiments with babies maybe 10, 15 years ago. And they injected sugar to the, to the water in a, in, a wife's, in a woman's wound. And the baby drank double than what he normally drink, because it was sweet. Babies love Coca-Cola. Give a baby Coca-Cola and see if he wants to breastfeed after that. He will cry all night, because he wants what he has, <laughs> much, much tastier. Sweet, sugar. All kids love sugar. So they injected sugar, the baby drank double. That's experiment number one. Experiment number two, they took a needle and they pinched him in his nose. This was in the third month pregnancy. Third month. Third month pregnancy, which is 90 days. Then he moved his head. They pinched him again, he moved his head. Pinched him again, he moved his head. Pinched him again, he moves his head. Four times. Fifth time fifth time, before the needle arrived to his nose, before he touched him, he already moved his head. They were shocked. They're 90 days old, three months old, the baby already understands that the danger is on the way, which means his brain is 100% functioning. He predicts danger. Most of the abortions in the world are done after 90 days, when he's a complete human being with pulse and everything. Now, the biggest hypoc hypocrisy in history, perhaps, is that the law is that if the baby is covered with skin of the stomach of the wife, and you put your, head in, your hand inside with a knife, and you chop him to pieces, and then you take the vacuum cleaner, and you vacuum all the pieces, then it's kosher. But if he came out, according to today's rules, then you're not allowed to kill him. If you kill him when he came out, it's electric chair in the United States, in some states, or life in prison. But if he's inside, a minute before the head came out, even in the ninth month in private cleaning in America, they make abortion, nine months. One week before the delivery. How they do it? Now they cannot cut him anymore, because it's a full nine pound baby. Cannot cut him with a knife. So what do they do? They inject acid, salty things into the water, and the acid kill him and eat him inside and make holes all over his skin and kill him inside. And then they make a cesarean. They take him alive and sew the stomach and sell the babies to China. I don't want to tell you what they do with that in China. I have picture of big garbage bags with bags full of baby's parts. Right here in New York, everywhere you go. And in Israel and in Europe, places there's no religion, people become monsters. Again, even fake religion is better than no religion at all. That's why I always say, it. if someone bow down to the sun because they think the sun is God, is better than a secular Jew. Why? Because a secular Jew is not afraid of anyone. Anyone. He does whatever he wants. He just doesn't want to get caught by the police. He has no values. He can steal. He can cheat. He can murder. He can do whatever he wants, as long as he doesn't get caught, because he doesn't believe in God. But a guy that believes in a strange God, sun, moon, idols, who knows what, but he thinks that that God has a power to watch him and to punish him, he's going to think a million times before he does something in hidden rooms. 
because he's afraid of a phony God. But at least he's afraid of someone. And that's why I always say, God says in the Torah that he cannot stand idols worshippers. He cannot stand them. And they deserve the biggest punishment, those who bow down to the sun and the moon. But in reality, some of us are much worse than them. At least they're searching for God. We don't even search for God, some of us. <laughs> Live 70 years, not one time. You think, who supply me oxygen? Who give me food? Who helps me? Who cure me? Who protect me so many times on the road? Nothing. Just give me, give me, and leave me alone. You understand? So, Paro and Shifra and Pua have an ideological argument about abortion. Up to 40 days, there's some arguments. Because since the baby is not complete, some say it's not a complete... For sure, it's not allowed. No one is allowing it. But it's not as murder as after the 40th day of the pregnancy. But why it's not allowed? Because even wasting seed, seed, which is a, dro a drop of liquid, it's not even a baby yet. It's already considered murder according to Kabbalah. And not only murder, genocide. As I gave a lecture last night, showing some sources, what, how horrible it is for a Jew to do such a thing. So it's needless to say, once it's conceived already and the sperm went into an egg and the baby is developing, that killing him, it's already a big serious problem. So Paro said, if I'm going to kill the babies after they come out, maybe there will be demonstrations in Egypt. All the, all the activists, the life activists, you know, all these people, they make, may make demonstrations. Not everyone is evil in a country. It cannot be. 100% of the, of the Gentiles, all of them are evil. No. There's many good people. They're going to say, what's going on? We have people live here, the, the descendants of Joseph, the, the treasury of Egypt, and now they all get killed after they're born? What's going on here? He doesn't want to make problems. So he said, no, it's abortions. Abortions are legal. He didn't come out. So what's the difference if he came out or no? Let me explain to you. If a woman, she's pregnant now, and the baby risks her life, so it's either him or her. Who comes first? The wife. The wife. You're not allowed to save the baby on, the life, on losing the life of the mother. Why? You don't kill one Jew in order to save another one. He's there already. He was there before. Somebody is coming to risk his life. The one who risks his life is called Rodef. He's a chaser. He's chasing after him. The chaser has to be killed, not the one who existed before. So the mother there, the baby is chasing her, not intentionally, but he's chasing and risking her life. Her life comes first. This is when, when the baby is still inside her stomach. But if his head came out, just the head came out, and is risking her from now on, you're not allowed to kill him to save her. Why? Because he's already out. So now the rule that we had before is no longer in act, in action. As long as he was inside the stomach, he wasn't born, he did not come to the world, he lives thanks to his mother. He suck his life from his mother cord. Without her life, without her body, he has no life. So his life is not complete yet. It's like a person who connects to a machine in a hospital. You disconnect the machine, he'll die. So his life is thanks to the machines. He doesn't have independent life. Where is the source of his life? His mother. So you don't disconnect the source in order to save him. But when he came out, his hair came out. What happened to the baby when he comes out? The Gemara say the biggest miracle. All the holes that are open, close. And all the closed holes, open. In one tenth of a second, everything turns around. The holes that were blocked opened up. The mouth, the ears, everything opened up. And it comes to the air of the world. And all the holes that were open inside, 
and receiving energy from the mother, automatically are black. Nobody has an understanding how something like this happened exactly in the right second. Otherwise, if it would happen a second before or a second after, I should say 20 seconds to be on the safe side, it will be dead inside or outside. Why? He needs to breathe on his own. 20 seconds, no oxygen, brain damage. That's why the first thing they do, they hit him on his back to make sure he cries, to know, to make sure everything open up, there's no complications. So Paro said to, him, to them, as long as the baby is inside, he's a part of his mother. It's like another organ on her body. Same thing like the cows. What does the Torah say? If you slaughter a cow and you found inside a calf, pregnancy, she was pregnant, you didn't know. You slaughter her, oh, you see a baby inside. This baby now came out. In the middle of slaughtering the mother, you open the stomach, he came out. Now you want to eat him. You bought one, you got one free. You want to eat him. Do you need to slaughter him or no? You don't need to slaughter him. Why? How? You just kill him and you eat him, like nevela. How can it be? Because it's considered an organ from the mother's body. You understand what happened? Because he didn't come on his own. So this is the whole argument here. When is considered murder or not? He is holding that there is enough time to see if the baby, the baby starts to take his head off, not the entire head. You can tell if it's a male or female, kill him right there. Don't let him come out. So that's not considered still murder. Nobody can make a beep. And they, they answer to him, I'm sorry, he already came out. You know, they, he already came out. They already came out. And he couldn't answer to them, so what do I care if they came out? Kill him when he came out. Why? That's already, he understand. That's, that's not going to pass in Senate. They won't approve that. You understand what's happening here? This is the argument right here, and today the same arguments are still, in, still existing. What did Hashem give Shifra and Pua for not killing the babies? First of all, you know, Shifra and Pua, when Paro told them, I want you to kill the baby, they, sh they could have said, everybody else would say, okay, so I quit. I don't want to be a nurse. I don't want to be a midwife. I don't want to work. I retired. I don't feel good. She bring a note from a doctor. She no longer can be in service. That's it. Let somebody else murder why they are considered righteous heroes that not, they didn't run away. They risked. they risked their life to save the babies. So what did Hashem do to them? He built them houses. What's the connection, houses, to saving life? All the reward and the punishment of Hashem is measure for measure. Measure for measure in the same thing. What's the connection between saving the life of the babies and building yourself a house in Queens Boulevard? What's the connection? The answer, which house is he built to them? Bate Kehuna Uvate Leviya. Hashem gave them a reward that the Kohanim and the Leviim comes from them. That's where Moshe and Aaron came from. So what's the connection now, Bate Kehuna and Bate Leviya to the babies? Paro had an, a mission. He says like this, look, how would I keep these Jews slaves forever? One day they'll come out of here, and they're going to build their own Bet HaMikdash, the temple. And, w and in Bet HaMikdash, they're going to need Kohen and Levi. I will eliminate all the Kohanim and all the Leviim. And like this, they'll never come out of Egypt. Because they, they have no reason to come out. Anyway, they cannot build the Bet HaMikdash. If there's no one Kohen in the whole nation, there's not one Levi. How are you going to build Bet HaMikdash? Kohen and Levi, without that, you don't need Bet HaMikdash. So what will I do? I'll kill only the, the male born. Not the female. Female never had the decree on them. They don't kill them. Only the boys. Let me kill the boys one generation. In the meantime, we'll force them to marry Egyptians, Goim. And the babies will still be Hebrews, because it goes by the mother. But none of them will be Kohen and Levi. Which Eda, which nationality? from all the Jewish nationalities in the world, do not have one Kohen in them. Very good. You never find by them one Kohen. You go there, 
no birkat kohanim. Maybe they have Persians, Bukharians, visitors, so they do birkat kohanim. But among them, you don't find any kohen. Why? I once asked that question. The answer I got is because they are the kuzarim, the nation of the kuzarim, that they were searching for religion, Christianity, Islam, or Judaism. They are not sure which one is the truth. So there was a big argument with the story of Rabbi Uda Levi, Sefer Kuzari. If you understand Hebrew, there's a great book that published by Rav Mordechai Neugershel, one of the most genius rabbis in our days, especially when it comes to Kiruv. He is the brain behind many of the proofs we show in seminar for the last 30 years. I definitely learn at least half of what I know just from him alone. And Baruch Hashem, I had a zchut to do two seminars with him together, which I, ver I look very high to him, because he's a mamash, a computer brain that gives the best answer to any question you can think of, the right question in the right time, short to the point. For instance, one time he had a debate with the Christian missionaries in Israel. They have plenty of them in Israel. They hunt souls of ignorant Jews. So the missionary was talking, 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 talking. Not like me. I talk more than the Christian. But by him, he is much clever. He only said one word in the entire debate. What did he say? The Christian was talking, 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 five minutes. And he was standing like this. He said, prove. Then the Christian talk, 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 talk. He said, prove. Talk, 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 prove, prove, prove. The entire debate, one proof. Then the missionary went crazy. He said, what do you mean? Spiritual things cannot be proven. Then he opened up his mouth. Said the opposite. According to the Torah, everything spiritual can be proven 100%. This is what Hashem said you should know, not believe. 100%. You should know I'm God. You should know I'm watching you. You should know I'm, everything you do, I'm watching you. I will judge you. Everything you should know. Nothing believing. Believing means not knowing. And everybody understood they have nothing to sell. There's two ways to do it. One way, the way of the student, and the way of the rabbi. <laughs> the rabbi, one word, he finished the debate with them. <laughs> you understand? So he wrote a great book about the kuzari, explaining, writing comments about the questions and answers that they ask. And all of them converted, real conversion, only conversion, for the truth, hundreds of years ago. And then eventually they don't have Kohanim, because if an entire nation become converts, they don't have Kohanim. Kohanim is only from the family of Aaron and Levi. Okay, let's continue. So, uh, Hashem made him a house of Kohanim and Levim. You prevented the plan of Paro to eliminate the Kohanim and Levim. Kohanim and Levim will come from you. Everything Midah connected Midah, measure for measure. One more thing we see in this parasha, Midah connected Midah. Miriam has to go and hide Moshe in the Nile. She put him in a box, in a teva. She covered it very well inside that there would not be any leaks. And she put him by the, by the Nile, in Egypt, by the Nile. And she was standing there for hours to see what's going to be with him, who's going to find him. Who comes? Batya, the princess, the daughter of Paro. She comes, she saw him, she took him, she saw he's in Hebrew, he has circumcision. He was born circumcised, Moshe. So, he said, oh, it's just children of the Hebrew, let me take him, adopt him. So she felt great, he's going to be adopted by the king, no problem. She was standing to watch Moshe. When did she get reward for standing and watching him and just not leaving him and run away for her life? Huh? When she got leprosy. When she got leprosy. Do you know how many years later it was? 80 years later, when Moshe was 80, Hashem sent him to take the Jews out of Egypt. Right? And then she spoke Lashonara against Moshe. Moshe already got married to Tzipora, the daughter of Itro. She didn't even speak really Lashonara. She just spoke about what Moshe did with his wife and all that. So she said a few words. Meaning well, again, for a brother that she admired very much, he lived thanks to her, but she said a few words that it wasn't to her level, she got leprosy on her body. Tzarat, Lashonara. So they have to isolate her now for a week, that's the law. The entire nation of Israel had to stand and park and wait for her to come out of isolation. 
If it would be somebody else, it wouldn't have this merit to make everybody in the nation waiting for me until I, I get cured. Mida keneged mida. You waited for him, everyone will wait for you. This is how it works. Then Moshe is growing up, he's a prince, he walks in Egypt and he sees the Egyptians with the whip, they're hitting the Hebrews, his brothers. What does he do? What does a rich person today in America does when you tell them Jews in Israel are suffering very much? Problem, war, poverty. If he's righteous, he writes a nice check and send money. How many of them would leave all their empire, the businesses, the mansion in Great Neck or in Park Avenue and come join now the fighting in Gaza, running in the mud, two o'clock at night, trying to save the land. How many? Maybe one? Nah, I don't think so. They send money. Here, I give you 100,000. Give you 500,000. Whatever, how much money is? Yeah, here is a million. Yeah, uh, let, and I read Tehillim for you. I read Shir Lamaalot in Shul, Shir Lamaalot, you know. Mi Shebarach, Yevarech et Chayelere, Agana L'Israel. That's what he does. Moshe didn't do like this. Moshe could send money. He's rich, he's a, he's a prince. He's an adult now, he's not a kid anymore. He has, he has power to give a lot of money, to help them. He came and worked with them. He was working with them, helping them, running, helping, bringing, ca carrying with them. Then, listen to this. This entire lecture is about gratefulness, in case you didn't get the point yet. What about gratefulness? You heard about Data and Aviram? It's two wicked people. The Torah already said that they are the one who put the man. When Hashem said tomorrow Shabbat, you won't have man falling. They went and put man in a field to make people do does not believe Moshe's words. They made a lot of problems, this Datan and Aviram. Very wicked people. They are the ones who made the golden calf. They did so much problems. So how did they come out of Egypt? All the wicked Jews died in Egypt. 80% died. How Datan and Aviram came out of Egypt? They are, they are the worst. They took the beating. Oh, very good, Sami. So what is it? They used to be the kapos. You know, the Germans made Jewish police, kapo. You deal with your own people. If you don't do a good job, we'll come and take care of them. Save us the headache. Make sure they do A, B, C. If not, we beat you up. It's the same thing the Egyptians did to the Jewish police. They said, we want this and this to get done today by 9 o'clock. It gets done, we leave you alone. It doesn't get done, you ta we take the police and we beat you up. The only two who agreed to take the beating and did not want to hit the other Jews, is still do it's two, two wicked Jews, Datan and Aviram. They didn't beat anybody up, and they beat them up every night. Well, every night they went to sleep full of blood. Hashem say for this, for caring about the other people and taking the beating, even though you're very wicked people, I would let you come out of Egypt and not die in the darkness, like 80% who died, in, millions died in Makat Choshech. 80% of Israel died with the Egyptians because they didn't want to follow Hashem and trust him. So now, Datan is the husband of a woman called Shlomit Bat Divri. She's one of the only women who mentioned in the Torah, but for negative. Sarah, positive. Rivka, positive. Rachel, Leah, positive. Over here, negative. Why they talk about her? Why her name is Shlomit Bat Divri? Divri means she talks to the men too much. How are you, Moshe? How is your day today? How are you, Yitzchak? Business is good? How are you? What are you voting today for the parliament? What do you care now? You're going running around talking to men on the streets. Not modest. Since she's talking to the men, one Egyptian fell in love with her. He wants to make a scene with her, one soldier. So now we know her husband is Datan. So he comes to him and says, you Jew, come with me, I want you to work. So he gives him a very hard job, and he goes and makes a scene with his wife. He promised her all kinds of benefits. She is not a modest woman, so she agreed to make the scene. While they're making the scene, this Datan felt that something is fishy here. He ran quickly home and he caught them. He caught his wife making a scene with this, with this uh, Egyptian goy, Egyptian soldier. So 
this soldier, in order for him to prevent the problems with his authorities, so he took his whip and started to beat him up. This is what Moshe Rabbeinu saw. Moshe is an Egyptian prince, he walks by, and he sees the Egyptian soldier is beating up this Datan. So Moshe Rabbeinu said the Shem Amforash, Vayach. He didn't hit him with his hand. He said something, the Egyptian fell, Moshe Rabbeinu buried him, and that's it. The next day, after Moshe saved his life, the next day Moshe walked on the street, and what does he see? The same Datan that yesterday his wife was making a scene, is beating up another Jew, who Aviram. <laughs> Datan is beating up another Jew. So before he even hit him, he just picked up his hand to kill him, to beat him up. Moshe said to him, Rasha, lama taker echar, you wicked person, why you want to eat your friend? So guess what he says to him? Oh, instead of saying to him, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that you had to see it, I apologize. What does he say to him? Why? What is it your business? You want to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? He started to scream that everybody here, look what an ungrateful monster. Yesterday he saved his life, and what does he give him in return? I, I remember when I was a kid in second grade, second grade, one redhead kid came to the class in a school where I was in Israel. There was a new kid in class, and kids sometimes are very mean. I don't know, I never understand why, but they're very mean sometimes. And everyone in my class was very mean to this kid, and I felt very bad for him because I found out that he doesn't have a father. I spoke to him and he found out that he's Yatom, and my heart, I felt bad for him, so I was protecting him. So the people started to get angry at me that I'm taking his side. So they decided to put me on a ban, harem. Nobody now talks to me in a class. No one is allowed to let me play soccer, nothing. And guess what? Two minutes later, this guy Shlomi Dick, his name was Shlomi, joined them against me. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Now he came to me, 40 years later almost. Exactly what happened here. I come, I save your life, the next day he turns around. What? You want to kill me like you killed the Egyptian, you fool, I killed the Egyptian to save your life. Ay, 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 that's called ungrateful person, ungratefulness. You know, let me give you another example of ungratefulness. There used to be a king named Ahaz. Let's give you Shi'ur Betanach now. Ahaz. He is the grandfather of Menashe, which Menashe is the father of Amun. This story that I tell you now appears in the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin. Ahaz, now this is a list of very, very wicked Jewish king. Very wicked, more than you can imagine. Ahaz, he tear at Ayrva. Allowed all the sex crimes that the Torah forbid, he said, it's allowed, it's no problem, it's not against the law. Who is Hashem to tell us what's allowed, what's no? I'm the new authority here, it's allowed, it's allowed, it's allowed, no punishment, you cannot touch these people. Menashe made a sin with his own sister, Forster. Could be more despicable than him. Amun with his own mother. Forced his own mother. Think about what kind of despicable people we had. His mother told him, you're not embarrassed of yourself? You're going against the place where you came to the world for? So he said, no, I'm not even enjoying to make this scene. I only do it because I want to get God angry. Wow. He said to her, what do you think? This is what I'm looking for? I just want to get him and I think this is the thing that will get him the angriest. That much how much he hates God. I only do it to get Hashem angry. This is three wicked king. Horrible, right? Horrible. Everyone agreed that the horrible? Wait. Just before you jump to conclusion, wait a little bit. Came Yoyakim, one of almost the last king, Yoyakim, and say, they are nothing compared to what I'm going to do to God. 
I will teach people what does it mean really to get God angry. You know what? One more thing I almost forgot to say that, uh, for instance, Menashe, right? Menashe was uh, Menashe was cutting the names of Hashem from the Sefer Torah with the razor and throwing it to the garbage. Every time the name of Hashem, he cuts it and throws it out and leaves the Torah with holes. This is how wicked he was. And, uh, you know, Amun burned the Torah, took the Torah with the torch and burned the entire Torah. This is the kind of people we had. Not only today we have all these liberal Jews who hate the Torah so much and do everything to destroy it and to allow gay marriage and all the things to get God angry. We always had people like this. The Torah warned us from these traders, always. But this is really hard to believe. Kaim Yoyakim, almost the last king, and say, I'm going to get God much angrier than those three before me. He say, God, we don't need your son. Don't do us a favor. We can manage without the light of your son. Why? There were seven different kinds of gold in those days. Today, the gold that we have is the worst out of the seven kinds that they have more than 2,000 years ago. This different quality of gold. The best quality of gold was named Zahav Aparvanim. It was reddish. Red burgundy. Of course, it's gold, shiny. People look at that, they couldn't, they couldn't take their eyes off it from, from the beauty of this gold. Why it's called Zahav Aparvanim? Par comes from the word par, axe that the color of it was like the blood of the axe. That's why they named it Zahava Parvanim. What was special about this gold? If you put it inside a complete dark room, light comes out of it and you see the room. Like what we have today, light bulbs? That was the light of that time. But only the very rich people could afford to put it in their house. He said, I'm rich enough. I have a lot of this gold. You want to take your son? Don't do us a favor. Take away the sun, I'll manage with this gold. So his advisors told him, we have a problem here. The Torah say, uh, the gold and the silver belongs to God. It's not really yours. Sheneemar, li achesev ve li azav, amar Hashem. Hashem say, I am the master of the gold, I am the master of the silver. He told them, no, no, no. There's another verse in the Torah. Hashamayim shamayim le'ashem ve'aretz natan l'vnei adam. The heaven is the heaven of God and the land, he gave it to the human being. Since he gave me the land, the gold is mine, not his. So what do we see here? That from all four wicked people, he's considered the most wicked in the Gemara. Now between you and I. You compare some fool that tell God, cancel the sun, I can manage with the gold that I have in my house. Is he worse than someone who raped his own mother or his sister or burned the Torah with the torch? What's the comparison? The answer is absolutely. Why? Such an ungrateful person is even worse than this despicable three. Whatever God gave him, he takes the wealth and uses it against Hashem. Who here can raise his hand and say, I'm not like this sometimes? We're not like this? Hashem gave you a beautiful car. What do you do with that? Drive to Manhattan and Motzei Shabbos to look at the goyot they're making scenes. What's the difference between this and him? Hashem gave you a bright, sharp head. What do you do? Instead of learning Torah, doing all kinds of scams. Credit card, this, fraud, forging, heating, cheating, insurance fraud. Why? That's what he gave you the brain for? Whatever, whatever you have. He gave you health, use it against him. Gave you children, use it against him. Make his daughter dress like a prostitute on the street, nine years old, already naked. You know, his son, make him earring, ponytail. Next thing, he makes him tattoo for his birthday. Everything to get God angry. Sometimes it's pure stupidity. Now, what can we do? <coughs> stupid is stupid. There's nothing you can do. That, there's not that much you can do. But most of these people do it on purpose. Almost every Israeli today have tattoos, and all of them knows it's not allowed. Don't let them tell you stories. They all know it's not a lot, not permitted in Judaism. 
So why are they so anxious to make tattoos all over the body like the black in Harlem? Why? It's their urge to go against religion, the urge to destroy religion, that's what drives people to do stupid and crazy things. The, the sad news is that they're going to pay big time for it. We have no idea how much they're going to pay. Well, then the Torah continues, Moshe find the bush is burning. The bush is burning, Hashem say, take, take off your shoes. In Bet HaMikdash, you don't walk in with shoes. Why? Holy place, you take the shoes off. Where do you think the Muslim learn that you go into the mosque without the shoes? In the time of the Gaon Mivilna, the king wanted uh, the, the, the Karaites, Karaites Jews, this is Jews that don't accept the oral law, only the written Torah. So the Karaites invited the Orthodox Jew to a debate in front of the king. So they came to the Gaon Mivilna and said, Rabbi, you the smartest rabbi in Europe. You go to the debate. He said, it's a waste of time for me. So he took one of his Talmidim. He said, you go, you handle it. So he came to the debate in the palace of the king 250 years ago. So as they walk in, they see that all the goyim, the king and his soldiers, they're all taking their shoes off before they enter the office of the king. So the Karite Jew took off his shoes and he puts them outside. And the Orthodox rabbi took off his shoe and was holding it in his hand. And he walked inside. So the king said, let's start the debate. You stand here, you stand here. So the Karai Jew said to the king, Your Majesty, before we start the debate, I want to highlight something here if you, if you didn't pay attention. So look at the nerve this Orthodox rabbi has. All the people here in the room took their shoes and left them outside, include myself. This, his shoes somehow is so important to him that he doesn't trust the king and his own advisors and he's afraid to leave the shoes outside that maybe you steal his shoes. You understand what I'm talking about? You understand why we hate them so much? So the king looks at him, he's holding his shoes in front of the king. Imagine he's come to Obama to a meeting, say, please take your shoes off when you enter. So you walk now with the shoes like this. <laughs> what are you doing? Leave it outside. No, no, no. Maybe your guys will steal my shoes. Ah, 40 bucks shoes, he bought them in Walmart. He's holding it like this. Now he wants to ask Obama for extra help for Israel. You think he's going to give him help? He's going to say, listen, go back to Bibi. Tell him to send someone normal, no? Right? So it looks very bad. So the rabbi told him, no, no, your majesty, God forbid, of course I trust you and your advisors. I don't trust him. <laughs> he said, why, you think he needs your shoes? The wealthy man. He said, let me tell you a story what happened 3,000 years ago, and then you will understand what I'm talking about. He said, 3,000 years ago, Moshe Rabbeinu went on the Moriah mountain before there was Bet HaMikdash there. And all of a sudden he heard voice, and he saw a bush burning. And God came to him and said, Moshe, Moshe, shal na'alecha ma'al raglecha, take out your shoes, because the place you're standing on is very holy. So Moshe took his shoes and put them there, and Hashem called him to the bush. So Moshe went towards the bush. After God spoke to him and told him his prophecy, he went back, and the shoes disappeared. You know why, your majesty? Because the Karai Jew came and stole his shoes. They hate us so many years, it's not from today. Even then, he had the nerve to come and steal the shoes from Moshe Rabbeinu. So the Karai, the Karai started to scream, he's a liar! He's a liar! <laughs> so why is a liar, the king says. There was no Karai Jews at that time. The first Karai Jew was 800 years ago. His name was Rabbi Anan. So the Orthodox Rabbi said to the king, Your, his ears should listen to his foolish mouth. He just finished the debate before it even started. <laughs> he came and said that Karaites only started 800 years ago. I'm talking 3,000 years ago. We got the Torah from Moshe and transfer from father to son 3,000 years. Now he came and said, no, our cult started only a few hundred years ago. And they come to teach us what to do, what not to do. So the king said, the debate is over. Get out of here. <laughs> Kick him out. These Karaites. Such nonsense, car rights, this, reform. It's all nonsense. You cannot understand one word from the written Torah without the oral Torah. Not one word. 
not sentence, a word you cannot understand. Sometimes the same word has two different meanings. If you don't have the oral law, you'll never know what Hashem meant. You, don't under, you have 613 commandments in the Torah, not one of them have instructions how to do, what to do, when to do, nothing. Where you put filin? Where? On what hand? It doesn't say. What is it filin? It doesn't say the word filin in the Torah. It just say ot aliyadecha. Which hand? Right or left? Here, 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 here. Where? What is it filin? Maybe it's a watch. Maybe it's riding with a pen something on your hand. Maybe it's shaving your hair a little bit. What does it mean ot? Ot, it means in general a sign. How do you know what sign? How do you know how to make tefillin? There's more than a thousand instructions of making tefillin. One of them you do incorrect, the tefillin is not kosher. One letter is missing from hundreds of hundreds of letters inside, it's not kosher. One letter touch each other, it's not kosher. You didn't use the right animal, it's not kosher. Did you ever see tefillin that is not black? The Jews were spread all over the world without communication, no internet, no nothing. One day they gather all to Israel, every shul in the world, you come, a black square box over here, and right here, towards the heart, everyone, all of them from a cow, everything exactly as the Torah say, with no communication, transfer from father to son. Uh, where does it say all of it in the written Torah? What do you think, that Hashem gave a Torah and would not explain to us how to keep the mitzvot? So what's the point of writing a list of 613 commandments in a written book? And nowhere in the world, explanation how to do. And yet, some of them has a dead sentence, if you don't keep or if you violate. Dead sentence. Or the soul get cut out of eternity, like Mechalel Shabbat. Has no share to the world to come. And the Torah won't say what Shabbat is? Come on. Who is this fool that even try to say such nonsense? So why are they saying it? They don't want to keep, just like the secular Jews, but they still want to be considered religious, that's all. The secular people lost their shame. They don't, want to, they don't care, they say, I'm not religious. Anichiloni, don't believe in it, Azovoti, I'm not interested. At least you say the truth. They are the same, but they're embarrassed to say. So they say, no, we're religious, but we only believe in the written law. But how do you know one word of the written law? There's no way to know. How do you know how to make tzitzit? How do you know all these things that the Torah says? How do you know how to write Sefer Torah? All the laws of writing Sefer Torah, it's all oral. How do you even have Sefer Torah? You cannot write Sefer Torah without all the oral parts, parasha p'tucha, stuma, spaces between one chapter to another, what size of the page to start, from where, even mezuzah. You know the mezuzah? The second chapter that we have in the mezuzah. The first one, Ishma Israel. Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Ve'avta et Hashem Elokecha What's the second one? Ve'aya im shamoa tishmeu It has to start nine letters from the beginning of the, of the row. It has to leave nine led, space of nine letters and it has to start after nine letters. You leave it empty and from there on it has to start. And if not, it's not a kosher mezuzah. So how would we know it without the oral Torah? <laughs> you write 100%, everything inside. But you didn't leave enough space, big deal. So you, instead of leaving one and a half inch, you left one inch. Who cares? Everyone understands what it means. It's not kosher. You don't have mezuzah in the door. So many thousands of rules like this that without the oral law, we would never know it. Pass from generation to generation, and these fools are coming to teach us Torah. You understand? One time, one of them made a mixed dancing party in Long Island. And someone called me up on Thursday. He said, tomorrow they make a big party. So I say to him, give me the number. I'll call him up. So I call up the person. He said, ah, it's no way to cancel it. We already make invitation, advertisement. So I said to him, but you know, you make, you're, mixing, you're making inside the shul. What, you're conservative. You're making inside the shul mixed party? How can it be? I never heard such a thing. He said, yeah, we're not orthodox. So I said to him, tell me, you put tefillin? He said, of course. I said, how do you know how to make tefillin? Where does it say in the Torah? I said, we don't believe in the Torah Shebaal Peh, in the rabbis. We only believe in the Torah, he said. So I said, you put tefillin? He said, of course. I said, your tefillin black, like mine? Of course. So how do you know how to make tefillin? It doesn't say in the Torah how to make. How do you know? 
you know from us, from the oral law, right? Why are you hypocrites? So he started to get angry. <laughs> I started to tell, you did Brit Milah to your son, I say? So of course, I'm a Jew, no? I made Brit Milah. So how did you know where to cut, how to cut, what tool to use, what brachot to make, what wine to use? How did you know? This is all oral. None of it is in the Torah. The Torah just to say, to cut in the eight days the orla. Nobody even know what orla without the oral law. What orla? It's not an Hebrew word. Now it's an Hebrew word after Hashem gave it in the Torah. It wasn't a word that they used before. It's a new expression. How do you know where orla is? Maybe it's this. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's the nails. Right away, 500 opinions what orla is. Every Jew make a different circumcision. Moshe, what do you do? I'm making Brit Milah to my son. Come, Moshe, come. Give me your ear. Hop! Baruch Atah Hashem, ala Milah. Then the next one, the neighbor, cut his nail. Baruch Atah Hashem, ala Milah. Then one, give him a haircut. So everyone will do a different one. Judaism will be over in one generation. So how everyone know where to cut? How everyone know how to use, what to use, the baby is yellow, you're allowed to cut, not allowed during the day, during the night, what's permitted, what's not, a woman can do it, cannot do it, a goy can do it, cannot, all these hundreds of laws, where they come from? Don't let anyone ever fool you with their nonsense. Excuses, the world is full of them, the truth is only one. Before we finish, so one last thing, you came, I started at 8. This, the lecture started at 8 because I have another lecture. So we have to know one thing now. It says like this. Yeah. Uh, when a person lives his entire life keeping mitzvot, being religious, not that he's not, but he doesn't make tova, he's not recognizing the good that people do for him, he's not reimbursing anyone with good, only wants to receive, not to give, is not appreciating what Hashem is doing for him, he can never ever be a kosher Jew. Not, no, not only not a kosher Jew, not a kosher human being, cannot be a good person. Why? Ungratefulness is the thing that God hates the most. Remember this, don't ever forget. Somebody asked you one time, what makes God the most upset at a person that is an ungrateful person? Not only that he's ungrateful to God, of course, even between you and a goy, this Ahmed is doing a favor to you, and tomorrow he needs a favor and you pretend you don't see, it's also a sin. Doesn't matter, doesn't only your rabbi is doing something so you want to kiss his hand or to help him to the car, because you owe him, he's teaching you or whatever, no! Anyone who did any kind of favor to you, you already owe him gratitude. You owe him gratitude. We do Birkat Amazon. Birkat Amazon we do. And some people say, oof, two and a half minutes, wow. So it's for 15 minutes, he sits in his chair in front of the Sidur, and he's thinking, oh, oh, annoying. How many times? Uh, maybe next time I buy Mazonas bread. Ah, now two and a half minutes, to do, not to do, to do, not to do, another phone call, this, that. Finally, he agreed to open the Sidur. So, ah, okay, no, yalla, there's no choice. Ah, I have to do it. No, it's Alakham. What can I do? So he goes like this. He goes like this. Ta -ta 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 -ta. 20 seconds is finished. All right, no, so now, why it's, what's this Birkat Amazon? Why it's a long thing? Hashem said to us, and that's what many people don't understand, we finish with this. Hashem said to us like this. If you really had to say thank you to every person in the world who participated in bringing this piece of bread to your plate, it would take you a thousand years and you wouldn't finish. If you wanted to say thank you to every person in the world that thanks to him you got this piece of bread on your plate, the list would be endless and you still won't finish. So what's, what, let's make a, an easier deal. You thank me and it will count like you thank everyone that I created. You thank me, it counts like you thank all of them. Why? Let me give you an example what I mean. Now you have a piece of bread. Where did you get it? From the grocery. 
So you have to thank the person who built the building, the person who renovated the store and put the sign and the door and the glass, the company who made the oven, all the employees who works there make the dough, the company who, who delivered the, 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 the wheat and the barley, the company who made the truck, the company who made the tires, the company who made the fuse, the company who made the, uh, the, the, you know, five million different kinds of companies alone. You have to thank. They all participated a little bit in creating this piece of bread. The road, who made the road, who, who put flashlights on the road, the neon lights that the, 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 the truck can see the road, the ones who made lines on the road. Everyone has a connection with a piece of bread. The ones who deliver the water, the one who made the hose that you get the water, the people who clean the water, the filters, the government who does this, Ooh, thousands of millions of people participated indirectly in this piece of bread. Gratefulness is so important, you cannot get away with that. And you really have to thank each one of them, but it's not realistic. What, all your life? You eat one lunch, finish. You have to sit 700 years. Thank you, John. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Muhammad. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you. Who is these people? Mustafa is delivering the trucks. Who is this? Is the farmer in China, Mr. Lee. He makes the wheat. Who is this one? This is this. This is that. This is the engineer. This is that. This is the prime minister. It's the government. It's the union. Ooh, what, what, what interesting life you would have. So Hashem saved us this agony. And he said, just say thank you to me, and it will count that you say to billions of people. And what do we do? Two and a half minutes? Oof. Ah, again. Too long. Uh, Rabbi, I heard there's a short Birkat Amazon for women. <laughs> Where is it? It doesn't, it's not my sidur. The biggest joke today is people go to stores to search for Mazonas bread. They have on the, on the window, Mazonas bread. Why? You don't have to say to Hashem, thank you, two and a half minutes. Only half a minute. We save you two minutes of agony. God forbid you suffer. You have to say thank you to God two more minutes. Don't worry, it's mezonot. Ala michia vala kalkala. Baruch ata Hashem. Ala michia, thank you. Baruch Hashem. Baruch shepteranu mon shoshel ze. That's what the people see. I think it's a punishment. If you're really a lover of God, you'll never buy Mezonas bread, even if you have the option. Never. Give me a mozi bread that I can say to Hashem and bless myself with the 50 different blessings in the end over there, which is the only blessing is 100% purely the oraita from the Torah. More important than the actual Tfilat Shmona Raven. And you have an opportunity <laughs> If a person would only know what he lose by buying mezonas bread, he'll kill himself. What is mezonas bread? Mezonas bread is lechem mezonot, sweet bread with honey, with milk, with apple juice, that they write that instead of making it with 100% water, they use a lot of juice and they make it like a cake. Oh. So you feel it. And you feel that it's become powder or it's, it's falling like crumbs. You feel that it's not regular bread, 100%, because they do it with milk and a lot of things. So because they mix it, it becomes a cake, you don't have to say two and a half minutes blessing. You only can say 20, 30 seconds, and you save two minutes a day. You understand what's happening here? 20 minutes a day. Bezrat Hashem, next Monday I won't be here. I'm going to Los Angeles. And please, every lecture in general, before you come, check in my website, divineinformation.com. On the top, you have events. Check if the lecture is on or it's canceled. Sometimes there's unexpected things. I have to go, I have to leave. You have to see if the lecture is on the day before you come to the lecture, because if for whatever reason it cancels, I have no way to reach people. So the only way to announce is on the website. Divineinformation.com, on the front page, on the top, you have events. You check. Next Monday, for sure I'm not here. The following Monday, 90% chance I'll be in Israel. I don't know yet. I'm waiting for them to give me tomorrow the final answer. So on the following Monday, you will follow up. I'm very happy, Baruch Hashem, more people came today. So unfortunately, next Monday I won't be here. Finally, you start a nice roll. You don't want to lose it, but it's not in my hand. But please follow the uh, instruction. Wednesday, I'm going to be in Brooklyn. I have a lecture in, uh, for dinner, Chinese auction of Bet Yaakov. If you know anyone in Brooklyn who wants to come, 9 o'clock. It's also in events. 
And Bezrat uh, Hashem, thank you, thank you for organizing, thank you Rabbi, thank you Emil, thank you very much. Baruch Adonai Lolam, Amen and Amen.